Thanks. Hi, my name is Stephen Herwig, and today I'm going to be discussing our work on the measurement and analysis of the Hajime IoT botnet. This is joint work with my fellow students, Victoria Harvey, George Huey, Richard Roberts, and our advisor, Dave Levin. Hajime um, appeared in the wake of the infamous Mirai botnet, but it operates very differently. It's different in ways that make it very amenable to dissecting and understanding the composition and dynamics of IoT botnets in general. Today, I'd like to discuss Hajime's most um, distinctive feature, which is its use of peer-to-peer -peer network for command and control. Also discuss our techniques for injecting ourselves into that network in order to monitor the botnet. With the data sets that we collect, I'll then present our analysis of features of the botnet. And this analysis really underscores the heterogeneity of IoT. And throughout, I'll discuss uh, some of the challenges and opportunities that this new wave of botnets presents to the security community. Hajime is so resilient because um, it mixes in with a public peer-to-peer -peer network, namely BitTorrent's distributed hash table, or DHT. BitTorrent uses the DHT as a means of keeping track of those peers that are hosting um, and fetching files. So let's just go through how it works really quickly. In BitTorrent, when a, host, uh, when a peer has a file um, that they're hosting, they take a hash of the file name. That hash gets routed through the DHT to the peer responsible for storing that hash value. And that peer doesn't store the file. Instead, they store this updating list of all the peers from which that file can be fetched. And typically, this announcement lasts for about 30 min 32 minutes or so, unless the host reannounces themselves. When a, a peer wants to go fetch that file, it, it forms the hash of the file name and looks it up in the DHT. The DHT returns a random subset of peers from which it can download that file. So how does Hajime use BitTorrent? Well, in much the same fashion, Hajime has bots have files or malware modules that they advertise in the uh, BitTorrent DHT. And they also use the DHT to find other bots from which they can download these malware samples. Um, but Hajime um, is different in, in two ways. First, how does it, what's it, the, the convention that it uses for forming file names? It has a very specific convention. First, it always uses the current day's date. Um, so every day the name of the file changes. It also includes the file type, and there are two file types, a .i, which is responsible for um, communicating with the DHT, and the ATK, which is responsible for scanning the internet and infecting victims. Also in the file name is the architecture. Hajime supports um, different versions of MIPS and ARMS, and these files aren't merely just cross-compiled one from the other. Each architecture contains different access methods and exploits specific to it. So this, is a, uh, this organization is really a dream to, uh, security measurement, um, to security measurement research. Every day, we know what bots are announcing, their actions, and at a rough granularity, the type of device that they're running on. But it does present some challenges, as we'll discuss. Okay. So the other way that Hajime is different is that in the way that it fetches files, it doesn't use BitTorrent per se. Instead, it layers on top of BitTorrent's UTP protocol, a custom application protocol. Now, prior uh, security researchers have reverse engineered this protocol, but key to our study is the fact that its handshake includes um, a key exchange between uh, two peer bots. This is great because it provides us with long-term identifiers. Those public keys are stable for the lifetime of the dot, of the dot I. So in summary, Hajime uses BitTorrent's DHT to find other bots. This makes taking down Hajime very difficult without causing collateral damage to the good part of BitTorrent. Hajime also uh, uses the DHT to find other um, bots from which to fetch files. In other words, it's difficult. There's no central um, position um, for which to monitor all of the botnet activity. So how do we monitor um, Hajime? Well, very simply, simple we join the DHT. So for each module that the botmaster has published, each architecture, each file type, 
we exhaustively look up um, the hash, uh, that file in the DHT and start collecting all of the bots um, that are hosting it. We do this every 16 minutes. Um, and we do it for a radius around the current day, two days before the current day and two days after. This is in case um, a bot has some skewed version of the current day's clock. In total, we've collected almost five and a half million IP addresses. Now, IP addresses are a little bit difficult to use as um, a long-term identifier. Because of ISP um, address reassignment or NAT boxes, there's just not a one-to-one -one, um, uh, relationship between an IP address and a device. That's okay. Um, Hajime's uh, key exchange provides us with a, a, a better identifier. So as we're crawling the DHT, for each bot that we find, we then immediately go and get its, its key. And we've collected over 10.5 million keys. To sort of drive home the, the difference in using IPs versus these keys, uh, we have here a graph. Uh, on the y-axis, it's the total keys that we found for each country. And uh, on the x-axis, the number of IPs that we found in that country that are infected with Hajime. So notice a lot of countries, India and China, for instance, uh, there appears to be some, some natting going on. And so if we were to use IP addresses, we would be undercounting the botnet population. However, other countries like Brazil, which is extremely um, infested with, uh, with Hajime, exhibit a, uh, the different behavior. There's some sort of uh, address reassignment going on, such that if we use IPs as identifiers, we would vastly overcount the botnet population. So in summary, our data sets are the DHT scans, all of the keys that we collect from the bots, and also we collect modules from, from, from the bots, and we've collected 47 in total and reverse engineered them. And we'll make all of this data available on our website. So with the data in hand, we now turn to the analysis. And in our analysis, we seek to understand two things. First, at any snapshot in time, what are the characteristics of the botnet? What's its size, location, device composition? And then, over time, dynamically, how do those features change? And in particular, we'll look at specific events, namely the deployment of exploits, and how those change the composition. So first, how big is Hajime? Well, well here we plot on the y-axis, it's the number of distinct bots. And for us, that means the number of distinct keys that we found. And on the x-axis, it's the time, going from January through May. So we see that Hajime starts out with a steady state of 40K. But then there are these two exploit events, um, Chimay Red and Jipan, which double um, the population of the botnet. Now, the botmaster uh, packaged both of these exploits only in the MIPS Big Indian or MIPSEB architecture. It's also noteworthy that both of these exploits uh, were zero days that were either leaked or um, public, um, publicized on the internet and within a matter of days incorporated into these ATKs by the botmaster. Also noteworthy is that each of these uh, exploits targets very specific routers. Shamay Red targets micro versions of MicroTik router and GPON, well, that targets GPON routers. So next, where are bots located? So over the same time frame, we'll look at the, the 10 most in infected countries. And we see this um, preponderance of bots in Brazil. But again, exploits um, really have a big effect. So for instance, with Shamay Red, before Shamay Red, Russia was very lightly infected. And then immediately after, it goes to having 6,000 active bots per hour. In the case of the GPON exploit, we see that GPON, the preponderance of that exploit, affects Mexico as mo uh, in the green. This really hammers home the point that um, the uh, deployment of IoT devices is not symmetric across the globe. It's very heterogeneous. Now, recall that the file name that we look up in the DHT encodes the architecture. So natural question is, well, what is the breakdown of architectures that these bots are, are running on? And we see, well, well overwhelmingly, almost uh, three quarters of bots run on MIPS Big Indian. However, 
if we drill down to the country level, things actually get more interesting. I mean, you might assume that it's MIPS Big Indian across the board, but it's not. For instance, in both the US and Mexico, they're very arm heavy countries. Again, an exploit can, can change this composition overnight. So if we look at GPON, for instance, it takes Mexico, which was uh, uh, one of the uh, fewer infected countries, and now it becomes the third infected country. Moreover, Mexico, which wasn't uh, arm heavy to begin with, becomes MIPS big Indian heavy. So again, new vulnerabilities overnight change the composition of the botnet. So whereas Shimei Red and the GPON exploit targeted very specific routers, Hajime has other access methods that are more device agnostic. For instance, like Mirai, it scans the internet for open telnet um, ports. So we'd like to know, well, what devices actually get infected? To try to answer that, we take our DHT scans and we intersect them with census data sets. If you're not familiar with, with census, they massively scan the internet to try to understand um, its state, the current services and devices that are running on the internet. Unfortunately, um, the, uh, this wasn't, uh, the results weren't too spectacular. Um, census was unable to provide device information on, on over 80% of our bot IP addresses. However, we should note that if we look at the identifiable addresses um, one day before Shimei read and one day after, uh, the results are quite spectacular. One day before, census uh, marks only 0.8% uh, of our data set as microtech, and a day after, that shoots up to 80%. So we've been talking a lot about exploits, but if we step back more generally, we might want to know, exploit or not, how well does Hajime's peer-to-peer -peer network um, work at propagating updates um, to the malware? So in this graph, we look at uh, the percent of uh, MIPS big Indian bots that are hosting and looking up each file version. And the bottom graph is the dot .i and the top the ATK. So let's look at the dot .i first. Each color is a, a different uh, .i version. So the first version is red, and then an update, kind of a white or purple one appears, and, that, and the bots quickly shift over. So this is more or less what we would expect. It's quick. With the ATK, though, it's completely different. In the ATK, we can see that there are sometimes weeks where multiple versions of the ATK are active. Also noteworthy is that uh, Comparing the two graphs, it appears that when a new .i um, is published, it gets all bots on board the current ATK. And so the reason for that is a .i will come and it will, the old .i uh, gets killed off and the new .i uh, rejoins the DHT. So it flushes any old DHT state. What's also interesting here is to think, well, if the bot master wanted to coordinate or choreograph a very precise attack, they'd have to do some work with their data eye in order to pull that off. So in the final um, portion here, I'd like to talk about an exploit that predates um, our crawling of the DHT. It's an exploit that we can observe in historic passive DNS. And it's also interesting because we see um, activity from both Hajime and Mirai. And so at least from this vantage, can roughly compare the two in terms of, of this exploit. So the exploit is with CWMP. CWMP is a router management protocol. So you can use it, for instance, to um, configure the NTP server that your router should use. So normally you'd say something like ntp.org. However, a bot like Hajime can come and, um, and set that value to something malicious, namely a shell injection. So a vulnerable host will take that shell injection unsanitize, shell it out, and um, connect back to Hajime. It would then download the .i and join Hajime's peer-to-peer um, -peer network. However, a non vulnerable host will sanitize that injection. It expects it to be a domain name, so it will issue a DNS lookup. That DNS goes, uh, lookup goes to a local resolver. And the resolver says, hmm, I know about .org and .com, but I don't know about this .slash 3. I've never seen that TOD. 
So let me ask a root server. And it happens that at the University of Maryland, we operate one of the 13 um, DNS root servers. So in particular, we mine through um, gigabytes worth of a historic DNS collection. And based on um, the features of the shell injection, categorize it as either Hajime or Mirai. So let's look at, um, and, and recall um, each instance um, of the shell injection in our DNS data site backscatter. So let, let's look at how much backscatter each botnet generated. Um, so for Mirai, uh, the, the use of this exploit appears somewhat tepid, whereas with Hajime, it's much more aggressive. In fact, the bot um, master deployed this to all versions of MIPS. And at the top, we have sort of the annotation of when those updates occurred. What's also interesting here is that, that blue circle, that's the first instance of backscatter that we observe. And that backscatter contains the IP address of the attacking bot. So naturally, we geolocate it. And we geolocate it to the Netherlands. Now recall that we've also been milking all these bots for their um, attack mod or ATK modules. And we reverse engineer those. Now much like Mirai, Hajime doesn't scan the internet uniformly. There are certain address blocks that it just avoids. Unlike Mirai, though, it, it avoids an address block that belongs to an ISP in the Netherlands. So the speculation here is that um, some of the uh, command is of Hajime is originating from that country. So we cover uh, a number of other things in our papers, uh, more details on the internals of, of um, the bot, analysis of bot churn, and more details on the device fingerprinting. Um, but in summary, uh, we're measuring and analyzing Hajime. We've amassed uh, these fairly large uh, data sets of DHT scans and public keys, DNS data, uh, and we've been analyzing it. The, the botnet is quite large and resilient, and our analysis highlights the, heterogene the heterogeneous nature of it and how overnight its composition can change. And we'll be making all of our code and data available on our website. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm not sure if I understood this correctly. Um, did you say that um, the number of uh, public-private key pairs that you were measuring is actually below it's actually above the number of IP addresses you were actually measuring? You're asking about For the size of the botnet, right? So you, you both had like the IP addresses and you also had like the keys, right? right? And I think in your graph it showed that the number of keys was actually larger than the number of IPs. Is that correct? For many countries that was the case, but for Brazil it was not. Because okay. the, the I mean, generally, like what previous work on like measuring like botnet sizes have said is that the number of IPs always overestimates the number of real bots uh, because of the IP churn, right? But in here, if you were actually observing the opposite, that would kind of like be a little bit surprising. Right. So, um, right. So part of that. It uh, could be just the IoT nature of it, that the devices are behind um, a, a router, for instance. That would be a possibility, but there's also yeah. a couple of other possibilities I can think of. Like, I mean, do you know for a fact that like a bot does not change, like keys? And also, like, can you discard the fact that maybe the same IP might be getting reinfected twice like with different keys? Right, so we discussed both of those things in the paper. and. Um, as I mentioned, the key is only stable for as long as the .i um, is running. So if a, a, an update for a .i comes out, then the bot generates a new key. Okay. So yes, it, it's, it's not stable in that way. And in terms of detecting reboots and reinfections, um, that's also very interesting but very challenging. <laughs> and uh, so we, we mentioned that possibility in the paper though. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.